So good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining for today's discussion. A very quick housekeeping remark uh, before we kick off. Everybody other than speakers, if you could please go on mute and uh, turn off your video cameras to get a better bandwidth for the session, that would be great. All right, thank you. Nishar, do you mind if we give a quick um, greeting just on behalf of the chapter and our committee before you get started with the official program? Absolutely, go ahead, Laura. Awesome. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Patel, and I'm the Director of Strategic Accounts at Density and the Vice Chair of Cornet New York's um, Programming and Outreach Committee. Um, since the beginning of May, or I get, sorry, the beginning of March, um, my months are, are bleeding by, um, and <laughs> since the shelter-in-place order first started, uh, Cornet New York really stepped up, and we've since organized nearly 50 events of uh, the type that you're about to enjoy this morning. Um, and specific to our, our Wednesday formats, um, we continue to do more of a deeper dive into a given topic that's, that's meant to be timely and relevant to our industry as we all kind of grapple with this new reality. Um, the last few weeks, our programming for this session has focused largely on reopening of buildings and the future of workplace. And today we're going to take all of that North American context and contrast it with insights and learnings that can be gleaned from Asia, a continent that is months ahead of us in returning to work. So I'm personally super, super excited um, to hear what Nishar and the other panelists um, ha have to kind of share about what we should expect moving forward. A quick plug for our next event of this type, um, which we hope you'll all sign up for, um, which is going to be on June 10th, uh, and I will actually be hosting it as moderator. Um, so hopefully Nishar doesn't leave too big issues for me to fill. Um, you can <laughs> register for it on Cornette's regular website. Um, it's going to be, at, again, June 10th at 1 p.m., and the topic is crisis as a catalyst, um, and we'll be covering kind of the overall impact of the pandemic on the real estate industry insofar as innovation is concerned. Um, so we'll be unpacking high level considerations like the effect the pandemic will have on the C-suite's view of real estate's role in the organization, um, how it's going to impact the last 10 years of progress uh, that was made to occupy our portfolios and whether this is going to change the importance of uh, the workplace moving forward and so far as attracting and retaining talent. Um, and so far, our panelists are the head of real estate management for Novartis Pharmaceuticals, um, the global head of corporate real estate and workplace and facilities for CBRE. Um, so not someone who consults with clients, but actually CBRE's own head of real estate, uh, who's responsible for their 8 million square feet uh, in North America. And then their senior vice president, uh, of Hudson Yards management with related companies. And a final housekeeping item, which I think uh, Nishar was just about to say, but unlike typical webinars, um, we've chosen to go a little bit of a different path with uh, Cornet New York's approach in that uh, we're use, utilizing a standard Zoom format instead of Zoom's webinar option, which would have all, uh, which would have made all of you um, silent uh, audience members without the ability to, to kind of participate and engage fully. And so to that end, um, we, we've given you a lot of control uh, over the next hour. And what I mean by that is uh, you're all responsible for your own audio and video. And so we just ask that you please keep your audio switched off uh, for the duration of the panel, but we'd love for you guys to engage really actively on the chat function. Um, chatting with other attendees and asking questions. And then after the panel wraps, um, Nishar and Thomas will call on individuals um, to participate who've uh, flagged questions in the chat. So um, hope you enjoy and Nishar, I'll pass it over to you. Perfect, thank you very much, Laura, for setting the stage. All right, let's kick off. I'm Nishar Fatima from Space Matrix. Uh, we have a tremendous panel with us today, which truly brings the global perspective to our topic, right? And before we get into the introduction of our speakers, I do want to share that I'm honored to have uh, sharing this moderator's chair with Thomas Bade Matisson from Altanova as my co-moderator for the session, who is not only a huge uh, sustainability ambassador or a green ambassador, but also as a chairperson of sustainability committee for the New York chapter. So thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for joining me today. I just wanted to take quick 30 to 60 seconds to kind of uh, share why this panel has come together today. Thomas and I both come from outside of America and work globally uh, on day to day. And so as many of you New Yorkers, right? So we thought, why don't we put together a panel or bring a truly global perspective to this discussion of our New York chapter today to kind of spin up the conversation about uh, uh, experiences and lesson learned from Asia. So not only during the pandemic, but also post pandemic times as some of the countries in Asia are 
already back to uh, back to work or we can call it back to new normal which is our favorite word these days right uh, so uh, well i would like to invite thomas to jump in here and share what audience will be expecting in next one hour thomas thank you nisha thank you laura and everyone good morning so over the next hour what we will do is we will start off by learning more specifically what uh, is currently being enacted uh, as a response to COVID uh, by, by the speakers and their teams. Uh, and thereafter, so that's a little bit more about, you know, what can we learn? Uh, and, and from there, we will move over to a more comparative uh, uh, set of questions where we'll be looking at how that actually does compare or not uh, from Asia and Pacific to, to North America. And then we will put that towards the end of the session in the context of time. So we will look at how things evolved during the, the months of the pandemic and also where we will be going ahead from here. Um, but before doing that, uh, it would be great if we can hear briefly from each panelist, just, you know, what is your role day to day? Uh, where are you based? Because this is truly global, so you're all based different places. And then maybe just briefly give a sense of how much of your role is currently directly tied to COVID response. We, we recognize that, you know, COVID touches everything right now, but, you know, how much are you actually working on that directly versus keeping the, the rest of your business going as, uh, as normal? So why don't we start with uh, Catherine, do you want to begin? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, Catherine Harrison Thomas. I work for Deutsche Bank. I'm the global business partner for corporate real estate and services, and that encompasses just about every, can, everything you can imagine to do with property and property services. Um, I would say COVID-19 is a huge part of our job and our responsibility. We work directly with our clients, with um, our internal clients, that is across Deutsche Bank, but also the regulators um, and local authorities as we make sure that Number one, we got everybody working from home safely. And now number two, we're in the process of bringing people back to work across the globe. Um, my team is central in that planning. Um, so yeah, it's consuming a lot of my time at the moment. Thank you. Stella, do you want to go next? Uh, hello, this is Stella. Currently, I'm based in Shanghai, and I'm from Pharma Teva Pharmaceutical. I'm uh, taking the response for global facility management in charge of uh, Greater China and uh, include Hong Kong, and also Vietnam office, uh, Korea office at this moment. So actually, uh, we, we, we are very lucky because we're already fully back to the office, uh, um, except Vietnam, only one of our uh, uh, some of our colleagues still do, running, doing their shift of work, but other countries we already fully back to the normal workstation. So I'm very happy to join this section and I think, I, I hope we can um, sharing uh, the knowledge to everybody and learn from each other, make our office work a little better. Yeah. Thank you and also thank you for dialing in so late. And Sanjeev, do you want to join? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm Sanjeev Tulichari. I run, <clears throat> sorry, I run the workplace services for Northern Trust and APAC. And I think COVID has really had, you know, all hands on deck, as they say. I think uh, the initial days were all busy with trying to ship equipment, laptop, PCs to people because we didn't have we had a certain percentage who had work from home capability. Others did not have because we didn't want them to have. And now it's all around getting the return to office. And, and that's, a, that's really, really a big one right now with, uh, with people having the apprehensions around coming back. And I think there's a lot of time and effort now being put in, in getting people back to work. So not a back to work, back to office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Important detail. Uh, Dennis. Good morning, New York. Um, uh, this is Dennis McGowan. I'm the uh, global head of property for Standard Charter Bank. Uh, we're a UK headquartered bank, but uh, predominance is mainly in Asia. Um, I'm responsible for 63 markets, 12.7 uh, million square feet, and about 95,000 employees around the world. In terms of COVID, I, we are the risk, property is the risk owner for health and safety, so therefore 
it falls within our remit. And I think the, the, the principle we're looking after at the moment is that just because you can return to work does not mean that you should return to work. So the, so the sort of mantra we're using is um, we'd rather you stay at home um, because we think it's safer and we think our buildings aren't ready to support you. However, if I look at China, 80% of our population are back. If I look at Hong Kong, 50% of our population are back. And if I look at Singapore, 3 to 5% of our population are back. So we've got quite a broad spectrum. Mm. Thank you. Um, that, that's brilliant. And I guess before we start getting into the office, one of the first things that we, uh, we'd love to touch upon, and which we here in New York are starting to realize, is, is a pretty significant challenge in itself is getting to the office. And so that has to do with transport and also get, getting in and out of the building. Um, Dennis, how have you been approaching that across your Asian portfolio? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, again, and, and Sandy may jump in here very similar. We, we hand, we're handling it in very different ways. And we, we are, we're going from one extreme to the other, where in, in China, as I mentioned, 80% of the population are back. And therefore, uh, predominantly, they're either being bused to work or they're having to get their public transport or cycle. So um, in a very different state to maybe where we are in India, where we have less than 10% back. Um, but pre-COVID, we had to bus 30,000 people to work every day and, and bus them home every night. That was part of the standard modus operandi. So as we start thinking about moving back to the office, we're going to have to start thinking about how do you start bringing 30,000 people back in? You, know, you almost have to double the, the number of buses. Uh, these people are used to having, you know, one, two, maybe even three hour commute each way, each day. Uh, so we're thinking about, you know, how do we, we, clearly we have to clean the buses more regularly and more frequently than we ever would have before. We're clearly going to have to put on more buses. Um, we, we, we're basically looking at apps. How do we use apps so people can book their spaces on these buses or the shuttle buses? So I think we're looking at technology to be able to be the enabler. Um, although we expect a slower return to, to the office and we have four principles. Um, we have one, which is the current situation we are in most of our markets, which is at the pandemic stage. We are, we are in the, uh, most of our markets in the protect, sorry, protect stage. So that's basically where you know, there's some, some people in the office, most people aren't in the office. Some of our markets like Singapore, sorry, um, China are moving into what we call prolonged phase. So measures are down, um, more people are back in the office, but the controls that we're asking them to, to handle are much higher. So you know, if we decide that we're putting buses on in, in China, we have to have social distance or physical distance in the bus. We have to help people book their space on the bus. So all the measures that we apply in the office, we're applying to the transportation that we provide. And, and that includes taxis and buses in, in some of our bigger markets. Great. So, Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, to bring that perspective. I think one of the only country which has been hit hard by COVID and still almost back to office is China. So Stella, why don't you share with us how you are getting to the office and what measures Chinese government have taken to make the public commute safe? Uh, previously, I dropped to my office, but after the COVID-19, I changed my uh, transportation way to the office. I use the subway. Why? Because I want to see how people, how much, how many people back to the office and how they go to the their their go entrance to their building, uh, because I'm from facility management. So uh, during my daily time, um, I normally um, we no normally go into the subway um, fast. We isolated the people to uh, previously we only have one entrance to the um, uh, major have one or two entrance to the major uh, subway but nowadays we open many more gates to um, to to split people to several groups and also we check the people temperature and be, be, um, we have to we, we must to wear the masks before we entrance to the subway and also in order to keep the people up health we we use the QR code which can share the IP address and check whether you from the high risk in zone supply so can I can share my QR code um, and also in the subway each subway ca cabinet we also have this kind of oh we also have this kind of QR code I need to change to not yeah here if I have the green color that means I'm safe. 
and but if I visit such kind of um, high risk location, my QR code will be show the different colors like, like orange color or red color. That means I cannot be uh, available interest to the uh, building because uh, they have property. Um, sorry, <laughs> my mythical creators just uh, shouted outside because he also curious about what I'm speaking here. <laughs> and uh, we, we will not allow to entrance to the gate uh, uh, building. And um, when we entrance to the building, we also need to be uh, wear masks and also show our QR code. Meanwhile, we need to uh, divide it uh, to separate people entrance to the elevator. I just uh, checked our elevator uh, facilities. It's normally it's like we, we can lift more than 10 people. It will be divided to half. That means in order to keep the social distance, we need to keep less than five people in one elevator. So if the elevator capacity is very smaller, we will request um, you just to take next, next elevators. And also, um, we will have the second round to check the uh, temperature before entrance to the our office uh, space. And then our administrator will keep aware you to um, use the hand wash or sanitizer to clean yourself. And also, sorry, I didn't saw the message. And also before we back to the office, yeah, some such like uh, from uh, some high risk location Wuhan, they need to do, do the um, COVID-19 test to, to prove their health condition. And if some people um, who get the managers approved, we are still available to work from home because at this moment it depends on people's condition. So, um, and also, I'm just thinking about the major roads of the uh, transmission is from the droplet also touched a transmission and also we need to uh, very be careful use the toilet. Our building management um, just to turn off all of the air conditioner before we back to the offices, they just did the uh, office uh, disinfection for all area includes the air conditioner duct. And also we can, we, uh, our property company come to each offices to keep remind us, um, don't forget to keep the social distance and also need to uh, take some fresh air, not long time stay in the offices. They will just uh, come to ring the bells and uh, keep con continues to just uh, interrupt our daily working life. But I think everybody al already have the, uh, civic awareness we need to be careful and protect ourselves and our mm. colleagues and also our families that is what we normally go to our office in our yeah. daily life so, yeah. so you, you well you're bringing up a lot of interesting points here and i like how we're moving towards the office because that's uh, where i'd like to go next uh, but uh, before that i want to make one note that we're going to go back to later which is data uh, and the app that you shared there that was very fascinating. Uh, and it's something that I think we should discuss a little bit more as, as we start comparing continents. Uh, but seeing that we're now in the office uh, and we're, we're really starting to talk about health and safety. I mean, that, that's what this is all about in the end. That's why we moved out of the offices and that's what we're all now figuring out how, how to deal with going forward. Catherine with your global view but let's focus more on you know asia pacific but but if you picked up something else from other parts of the portfolio you know feel free to to to, uh, to blend that in what has been the main way that you've gone forward to ensure the health and safety in the office so i think that there's a number of measures i think you've got to be just very very practical um we've marked out um, two metre uh, distance zones as you're queuing to get into lifts in all of our buildings now. We've marked them out for grab and go in the restaurants. We've modified all of that um, facility to do grab and go as opposed to seating and, you know, hot meals and things like that. So that's, that's a big change. And again, that's all marked out. 
exactly, I think, as one of the other panelists was talking about with the lifts, um, we've calculated for every single lift in every single building we have globally, I think that's well over 2,000 uh, properties. We have worked out exactly what capacity we can take in those lifts. And we've used measures again to mark out the lifts so that people should stand in certain places in the lifts to ensure social distancing. Um, we are staggering people's entry time to buildings um, as we bring people back. But I think Dennis said it earlier, you know, we are, we're still very much, even in those locations where we can work uh, in the office, I think we're still very much trying to help governments um, and health authorities around the globe by if we can work from home and we can be productive um, and we're not putting any kind of risk into the financial markets, then really we should work from home. And so mm. we're trying to take the pressure off of things like the transportation systems, you know, trying to take down the risk profile, you know, for the R number that everybody monitors so closely in every country. Um, so I think that's still our modus operandi. Um, we have obviously enhanced our cleaning um, for those functions which we really do need to bring back in very highly regulated ones or where the work that they're doing could enter, could you know incur at some kind of financial systemic risk then we're looking at split operations um, where part of the people work in our disaster recovery site and part of them work in the office that helps our our resilience uh, within our teams if we get an infection there's still you know half the team hopefully that that, that absolutely is out of the danger zone um, but I think it also, again, just helps us with the social distancing um, across the floors. So, for example, there are desks that are marked out saying, you know, this desk can be used or this desk can't be used um, as we phase in people. And we're still able to do that right now. Um, and, you know, I think the other things that we've done is we've found some pretty interesting products on the market, actually. So, for example, door handles, door plates, lift buttons. We've got coverings for them called Silver Iron coverings which basically you know kill all bacteria and germs so if somebody already takes it you know it's killing it immediately so it doesn't put too much pressure on the cleaning teams um, who you know undoubtedly you know that would be pretty tough call for them to get every single you know door handle at every single part of the day right that's just not practical so we looked for something to really help beef that response up as well and I think you know I come back to I think people are generally taking this really seriously. They do care for their colleagues. They do want to be able to come back to work. And so people are behaving properly to mm. allow people to come back to work. Um, because I think from a mental health perspective, and this is something else that we've really looked at, particularly if you're living on your own, this is a really tough period of time. Um, if you're in a one bedroom flat in the middle of a city, that's pretty <laughs> exhausting if you're spending all your time on your own. And so, I think the other thing that Deutsch has done a brilliant job at is its mental health awareness mm. and the first aiders, and we've really deployed those. And as we're considering who's coming back into the office, that's also a part of the consideration because we want to take, uh, you know, take the time to look after our colleagues. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think some of the great points you brought up that, you know, apartments are smaller and uh, we will talk about density and portfolio sizes in a second. But I wanted to turn to Sanjeev because uh, we are talking about cleanings and masks and, you know, uh, the team coming back to employees and announcing, as Stella mentioned, about social distancing. But I know from our earlier discussion, Sanjeev, you mentioned that you have a very particular initiatives uh, within uh, your organization throughout, which is rolled throughout Northern Trust. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the tool which you have provided to all the employees. Do you mind sharing that with our audience today? Yeah, uh, sure, Nisha. And I think, you know, adding to what the previous speaker said, I think one big worry when people come back to work is around touching points which are common, you know, elevators, go to the cafeteria. Now you are encouraging people not to bring food, you know, bring your own food, then you've got to heat it up. So you've got to, so you've got to touch doors, you've got to touch access card, you've got to touch uh, buttons in uh, restrooms, uh, you know, everywhere. Uh, you know, you've got to heat up your food, then you need to use. Uh, so, we, so we said, uh, how, how much can you clean? right and uh, what periodicity of clean so i think it's one of the things that came up somewhere somebody sort of designed a key which i can put it up there i don't know if any of you can see this can you see this can you put it a bit more in the center 
Yeah. Aha. So, Let's so, bit, so you can hold it. You can hold it like this. Uh, can everybody see the key? Uh, if you could bring it a little bit in the center, uh, Sanjeev. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know what. what yeah. <laughs> Is the center? No, Just we can't. It's completely gone out of the frame. Now, now. A little bit in the. In the your... yeah. yeah, that's yeah, perfect. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, this is an idea. It's not my idea, so let me not claim credit for it. But this is so you know, this is like uh, this is one thing that we call you know, day one when our employees walk in, you know, as part of the joining kit uh, and saying, use this. Uh, and so anything that is a common touch point, use this, and then you can you know use your own sanitizer and keep this safe, you know. Uh, looking at keyboards, right? So we use sort of getting a keyboard cover for everyone. Use your own keyboard cover. You know, the people may be cleaning it, but use your cover. When you go home, take it with you. So you, it, it personalized. So I think, you know, return to office is, uh, is a big project. And, and uh, it's a big, big, ch big challenge. And there is a lot of apprehensions out there. So I, and I think whatever you do is less, you know, uh, and, uh, so I think it's it's a big factor, uh, you know, whether number of people, two meter this, uh, two two meter gap, planning in terms of, you know, there is uh, enter the office from east wing and get out from the, the west wing. You can't turn back. There is a, you know, there's a mapping done on the floor. A particular path you do, you walk so that you're never crossing somebody. So people, companies are going at great length to make this return to office, uh, uh, you know, a successful program. Yes, so, um, you, you mentioned you mentioned um, density, uh, Nishar, um, and right now there's there's a lot of discussion uh, going on in in terms of, you know, uh, are do we need more space? Or, or do we need less? And also, do we need different space uh, or not? Uh, Dennis, how are you approaching that question? I know it's a big one. Uh, by the way, you're on mute. I, I think, again, it's very much market driven. Um, we are we fundamentally believe that we will have a higher number of people, a materially higher number of people working from home on a sustainable basis post uh, COVID. Um, probably we will see some people who won't ever come back to the office. So we're anticipating there will be a significant move to work from home, both from a dedicated work from home standpoint. And we, we only have about 1% of the population today that works from home. And we think we could be as big as 50% coming out of COVID. Um, we believe there'll be a, uh, a significant number of people who do five days a week and we believe there'll be a, what we call the hybrid model which will be two to three days a week. Um, we think the the role of the office will change in that it will not be about desks and it will be it will have a new purpose and we're not really clear on uh, what that purpose will be at the moment and we're not sure anybody's terribly clear on what it will be. Clearly there will be uh, about 50% of the population certainly from a standard chartered bank that will be back in the office but we will give them the ability to choose when and where to work. Um, we will equip those people who work from home, be it full-time or part-time, with furniture and we'll look at giving them utility costs. But defining what the future of the office is, is, is very unclear at the moment. Although we, what we do believe is that we will um, probably default to virtual meetings rather than face-to-face -face meetings. So we, we think that we like the use of Zoom and Blue Jeans and products like that. So, and we think it's a great equalizer amongst our 95,000 people. So we think the default will become that, whether you're in the office or whether you're remote, uh, we think the VC capability will be the default. We think you'll come to the office to do things you potentially can't do at home. And I think it's all around the collaboration, the communication, the collision points. Uh, we think there'll be a huge amount of socialization that will happen in the office. In the office. So we, we're almost creating experience centers or community centers rather than what we traditionally call the office environment. So we think the physical environment will materially have to change. So I don't predict that we will take any more space. I, I believe we will take less space, but I think the use of the space will materially feel and look different to what it does today. 
Um, it clearly will be barrier free. We'll take a lot of the walls that exist today out. Uh, we'll be looking to take a lot of the security controls where we can take those out. Um, but we think uh, there'll be much more F and B because we think people will come to the office to do something that maybe they can't do uh, socially with their colleagues. We think there'll be much more technology solutions in collaborative spaces as well as collision, within collision spaces. We firmly believe that we will remove any entitlement that we've got today. So anybody that's allocated an office today, we have about a thousand offices for, for 100,000 people. Um, we think they will be repurposed to being uh, meeting rooms or collaboration rooms in the future. So I don't think we'll take more space. We certainly will have less space, but I think the purpose of the space will be very, very different. I, I think just because I think it's a very interesting example. I mean, it's a bit specific to you being a full service uh, bank with branches. But what are you doing? I, I know you have an initiative that you're considering maybe converting some of your branches as well to other space. Yes. Yeah, so, so today we have, a, we have about a thousand retail banking outlets around the world across our 63 markets. And we believe that they will have potentially have a role to play both for our staff as well as our clients in the future where they would, uh, we believe that potentially opportunities for communities to come together. So you know, out of CBD, uh, the ability for communities to come together, uh, customers or clients of the bank to meet with their supply chain, but also to meet with their customers or their colleagues. So we think there's a, there's a potential for a branch to become part of a membership service that we can maybe offer for our car facility. So I, if you can imagine a coffee co-work bank type space, that's really cool. In the, you know, we, we, one of the other things that we're doing, which I think uh, could extend into to our branches, today we're delivering um, virtual well-being to, to the 95,000 people at home today. So we are delivering live uh, yoga, meditation. I did one today for half an hour, exercise classes via Zoom to, to the 95,000 people who support. We think that would be another facility that we could be offering our clients as well as our colleagues uh, in these sort of near home solutions which we're calling branches and it's all about delivering a different experience yeah. you know, then, you. dennis you gave me a great clue for my next uh, question which i wanted to jump into regarding the density versus portfolio uh, i think in asia an average home sizes fluctuates anywhere between 600 to 1000 square feet right uh, and a lot of countries like china and india have multi generational families living in the same houses and hence extremely challenging to work from home, unlike uh, areas like North America. And I was just checking the stats and it says North America is about second uh, largest home, average home sizes in the world. So uh, it, it actually adds a pressure on a CRE leader in even higher uh, in Asia Pacific compared to the other part of the world. So how do you manage those uh, challenges? And Catherine, if you can go for this one, because I know you, you're managing the entire globe, so it will be much easier for comparison between North America and Asia? Yeah, I think, I think we've done, we, we were quite early on, we realized this would be quite a problem for a large sections, yeah, particularly India, China, Vietnam, um, across Asia, Korea, you know, Sing even Singapore, you know, so we looked at this and I think very early on, we went to a more of a split operation style approach where we allowed staff to rotate in and out to keep stress levels down. I think in the early days, it was very stressful for people suddenly thrust into small flats, as you say, often with multiple uh, uh, generations of the family, but, but also other working members of the family. You know, you know, when you've got three or four people all trying to go suddenly virtual, you know, your bandwidth tanks pretty quickly uh, if somebody sticks Netflix on, you know. so you know for you know the children etc so this has been such a challenge and i think that's what we we worked with our hr divisions the technology divisions we had to do a lot in the early days to beef up the actual deutsche bank infrastructure to put so many people to be able to work from home but but ultimately a lot of it is local right if your local provider um, isn't that great for bandwidth then your whole virtual experience with working is going to be pretty dire um, and so you know to an extent the employer can do some things but we we can't overcome all sorts of issues but um, but I think that's you know I, you know it's interesting Dennis used a word and, and it's the word that we keep coming back to all the time you know 
as a bank, the last thing you want to be doing is lurching from one operating model to another, because the transition period is where you probably have the greatest risk. And what we've got to do in, a, in such an enormous crisis like now, the banks actually are really important in maintaining a steady uh, set of, you know, markets and the, and the economies, you know, particularly with governments borrowing so much money, it becomes even more imperative. And so at the moment, I think the regulators particularly want us to come up with a sustainable model on the basis that the likelihood is we are not going to be out of this and into some kind of new normal for at least 18 months, you know, vaccine or no vaccine. So, um, you know, from, from that perspective, it's been imperative on us to come up with models that we can sustain over that duration. So I think Dennis, you know, was absolutely right to mention that. And I think although the banks are looking at that, you know, we talk to a lot of our clients and customers and counterparties, and I think there are a lot of big companies looking at that too. Um, and I think the thing that's been probably the biggest surprise of all is how well everybody's adapted to work from home. Yeah. Um, and the enormous, you know, positive feedback that we've had from our staff um, as part of this experience, you know, people work long hours um, and, you know, particularly New York is like London, you, you know, the commute times are horrendous for a lot of people, you know, upwards of two hours. And so I think taking that out of the day, um, I think a lot of people have really appreciated. And so I think when you balance it, and, and I think Daddy said again, something really important that we've been thinking a lot about, when you balance that with, you know, when you can do all of your kind of thinking work, a lot of your virtual meetings and things from home, so your desk driven work, why will you come into the office? Well, you're coming to the office to network and connect. You're coming to the office to collaborate and challenge. Um, and so what the office then becomes is quite a different um, uh, mix of spaces than, you know, traditionally today. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting as companies figure that out. And, you know, the one thing about real estate is, uh, sadly, we're not uh, a fast industry, right? So, you know, leases are pretty sticky commitments, um, investments, and, you know, that we depreciate deliberately over 10 10 years or longer now under the, you know, the life of the lease, um, you know, that doesn't just go away overnight. So I don't anticipate um, that there'll be an enormous swing uh, with, with companies getting out of space, you know, overnight. I think the company, I think companies who do this well will do it in a steady way, in a thoughtful way, working with their employees. You know, we just, um, we just surveyed over a hundred thousand employees in Deutsche Bank, you know, and, and, and full-time contractors at Deutsche Bank. Um, and it's been really interesting what they've fed back, you know, and a lot of it, you know, comes back to balance, work-life balance, having the ability to really concentrate, you know, open plan offices are great, but, you know, but actually they're really noisy. And sometimes it, it, it can take you twice as long to do a task that it, that it should do if it's a kind of knowledge driven, you know, deep thinking task. Um, and people are able to do that really efficiently from home. What they're really missing is a great cup of coffee. We had that fed back. So food and beverage at Dennis, absolutely on the money. Um, what they're really missing is the social side of their work. And what they're really missing is that collaboration. I think virtual tools are fabulous, um, but they're not quite the same as being in the room and scrumming around an idea and, and you know, that getting that, um, I don't know, bounce of energy that you get when you're, you know, in person. So I think, it, it, I'm, I'm not a proponent of the office is dead. <laughs> I, I think there's a really happy medium. So uh, I'll be interested to see, you know, how companies figure it out over the next two, three years. So, well, I mean, now you're opening up so many things. I, I think we could keep <laughs> the panel going for three hours with all of the interesting <laughs> points you guys are bringing up. Um, so, you know, we, we've sort of moved over to the, the comparison a, a Asia states here and how much we can compare, for example, with the narrow, uh, I mean, the, the, the less tighter space that you have uh, typically in an Asian home versus a North American home. Um, and now, you know, I think uh, some of Catherine's comments were also leading into the future and also how do perceptions evolve over time. So we're gonna double down in on that, but before doing so, Stella, I was very curious, and I know that a lot of people here are, about data and privacy. And uh, also, you know, ju just the sense of 
uh, of being part of a greater community and, and also how governance is being handled in Asia because we know that the model is a little different to, for example, uh, the United States. So how, does, how would you say that the general perception is about sharing data about your health? I mean, it's not necessarily a choice everywhere, uh, but still, how do people feel about that? Uh, because we're seeing that it has some fantastic benefits from a management point of view with, for example, the app you just shared. Yeah, actually, at the beginning, um, we also have a lot of concern, but I think it's some um, different culture. Um, uh, we uh, Western or uh, US people um, nowadays, more and more Chinese um, just think it's kind of a responsibility to keep myself, to prove myself health. So more and more people, even we have very uh, many foreigners work for uh, working in Shanghai, also work in China, and they are very proud and uh, show us their QR code, green color, I'm safe. And, uh, and, and also with this code, they can very easily go entrance to every um, building except you know, if somebody feel not good they will um, just come and I call the hotline to ask for, for some help instead of directly go to the hospital or go to the company so we we and we also have some hotline um, data checking um, and also can trace people as you mentioned, how to keep your privacy. And um, actually, we have a, a lot of people work behind of the data. And um, in order to protect your personal privacy, not only our IT colleagues, but also our government did a lot of work. So okay, also, as you mentioned, is if somebody else ha hacking the data, we will be in, in trouble. But at this moment, people just want to prove they are, they are unsafe, they are, they are safe guy. So um, we don't have too much concern for, for normal, normal in people. We don't have so much concern, but also uh, from special vacation people. Sorry, I, I saw one message to me, but I cannot. It's we okay. We will open up some time at the end for, for Q&A. Uh, so uh, we'll make sure to get to the ones that we can. Um. Yeah, I just wanted, yeah. I was curious about the earlier uh, question, Dennis, uh, Den the, you mentioned, Dennis, about the surveys. Uh, when we spoke initially, you said that you are rolling out this service to all your global 95,000 employees across the globe. And uh, if you have received it already, what are some of the findings? Are people wanting to work from home more or they are happy to come back? Like Catherine said that it's very, very important that you know we come back and collaborate. And especially becomes challenging when we are talking to three uh, financial corporations here on this panel itself, right? The security piece, how do you secure that if people wants to work from home? So if you could a little bit talk about uh, surveys and if what are the returns of the surveys, Dennis? Okay, so, so we... Um... We've used a product called Leasman Survey. Um, historically, the last two to three years, we've done Leasman surveys in our office. As I mentioned before, we have 95,000 people. We typically get a 37 to 35 to 37,000 people response for in the office. That's uh, and this is a workplace survey that's on top of the bank's engagement survey, where we get almost 100% response from the 95,000 people. But this year, um, because we haven't got people in the office, uh, we sort of pivoted. To, uh, to do the work from home, uh, what we call Leasman survey. Uh, that went out last week. Um, we're one week in, as of this morning, we have 12,000 responses. Uh, we will have uh, our first view on the dashboard, uh, I think the first week of June, so next week. So we, have, we don't have data per se at the moment, um, but we have a, an encouraging response so far in the space of one week. So, so people are clearly very interested. And, and this has followed um, what we call a pulse survey that we did about three weeks ago, where we specifically asked people uh, as a COVID survey, how are they feeling about working from home? There was one question that came back which showed there was a degree of negativity or the lowest score, I think it's about 76% said that uh, it's a positive experience, but they're not officially equipped to work from home. It could be not having the right furniture, it could be not having the right technology, or just not having the right space. And that prompted us to, to do a leasement survey. So now we're 
we're in the midst of a, a two-week survey where we're really trying to deep dive into people's day-to-day uh, -day lives to understand what does work and what doesn't work. And that then will inform the conversations we're going to have in two weeks' time, which is really about what degree of, uh, of our population will ultimately work from home full-time versus maybe part-time. Uh, and, and as I said, we sort of expect that to be around 50%. But this will be a real acid test to see whether uh, what the, is the data supportive of that. And then it will also help us inform what do we need to provide those users at home to make it a more uh, beneficial, more, a better experience for them. So I early days. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, Dennis. Oh, please. No, go ahead, please. No, I, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So uh, I was going to say, I mean, one of the interesting things with these surveys is that, you know, they're definitely not going to give us all of the answers, um, but they're very important data points. Uh, and and can provide for more informed decision making. Now, Sanjeev, have you whether you've based that off surveys or or other feedback? What has been your perception of your workforces changing opinions uh, about the whole situation? You know, I think there are two things at least that are going on right now. One is the group effect. So when everyone is at home, then of course, people will feel more comfortable with being at home. When people start going back to the office, for example, uh, then what's that going to do with the perception of other people? Will more people then wanna go back to the office? So there's the group effect, but then there's also a little bit the fear factor, right? Which is uh, the virus in the beginning uh, definitely created some fear. In, in the population and and so it it was easier to uh, have a cohesive approach where we all stayed safe at home to the extent possible but as we gain more control on the virus uh, that perception may be changing as well um, what are your observations from northern trust uh, I think getting back to work is it's a very slow process uh, and it will, uh, so I, I would say there is, a, there is a people thinking and there's a company thinking. From the company perspective is there is a pre-vaccine and a post-vaccine. So pre-vaccine would be a slow and steady return to work. And, and there is no numbers being thrown there. It, we will start slow and then slowly, you know, push that number up. I think that's the general thinking. From an employee perspective, I think there is a big, uh, I would say there are three types of thinking. One, desperate to get back home, sick of being at home, you know, and, and from an Asia perspective, you know, uh, smaller homes, uh, you know, uh, there are certain other challenges, you know, which I'm sort of digressing. You know, we have cases where there is a couple working and they both work for two competing banks, right? And they both sit on the same dining table and work, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, so those are some of the challenges. So I think you, and then we, uh, so we have a set of partner or employees who today desperately want to get out of their work and come back to the office. That's one. There is the other end of the spectrum are employees who say, you know what? Company X and company Y have said they don't, they're not getting, asking the employees to come back to work in 2020, please come back to work in 2021. We don't want to come back to work till that time we don't see a vaccine. And, and there's a big chunk, which is right in the middle, who are actually looking at the pioneers who are desperate to get back to see how they experience this, right? And then take the measures. So I would say, uh, so I would divide people wanting to come back uh, to work under these three categories, right? And uh, I would say the majority is in the middle who, are, who is waiting and watching and, uh, and to see how this goes. And I, I think the large part on this would derive uh, this thing. As the COVID cases in each country, it depends. If the COVID cases in each company go south, the people wanting to come to work will go north, right? I think there's, there's a, there is a great proposition there. I mean, 
That, that's what I would say is the current thinking among people. The discussion would be incomplete if we don't talk about uh, future proofing and the workplace designs because we have, I see a lot of service providers on the call as well. So uh, what, are, what are the discussions around future proofing your workplace uh, for any future pandemic of this sort of, or any, of dif uh, or any different nature, right, for that matter? And are there any specific design initiatives which you are strongly following across all your workplaces? Uh, if Catherine, if you could share your thoughts from the Deutsche Bank perspective. Yeah, sure. I mean, we've got two big projects that we're delivering at the moment, 21 more fields in London, uh, which will house around 5,000 people. Um, and then our new headquarters in America at One Columbus Circle. Uh, One Columbus Circle actually delivers sort of, you know, Q3 next year. So it's completely on our mind. Look, I think, I think there are a couple of things around this. I think definitely from a... Um, hygiene perspective with all of the things like the air conditioning systems as I said the, the, the sort of handles and plates trying to come up with touch proof ways to open doors lifts that kind of thing I think that's definitely all in our thinking right now as we consider these two big offices um, I think from the desk perspective um, we were not hugely dense anyway so I, I don't think we'll have to do an awful lot more you know even on our trading floors um in one Columbus circle i think um it's important also not to lose sight of the fact that you know trading floors are buzzy places they need to feel busy and full i think were you to empty that out it would be very odd um and so i think it then it's then really important for companies to really have very clean air conditioning systems change the filters perhaps more you know prevalently than you would have done um, to ensure that the air is as clean as possible um, and that you can therefore really host people. I definitely agree with Dennis. We, we had already anticipated a shift anyway. You know, one of the interesting things that we noted as we were looking at these two big strategies was for the first time, uh, we were going to have a minimum of five generations in the workplace in both of those locations when we moved in and to design an inclusive environment for such such disparity in age and experience and use of technology is also pretty challenging and so when COVID-19 came along um, that just you know added into the things that we would have to think about to, to make those offices still appealing um, and I think look the challenge is this I think food and beverage and things like that I totally agree with Dennis I think that really um, will be something that will become important I think the experiential side of things is also really important you know in London for example 73 percent of our workforce will be millennials and, and beyond um, when we move into that building and I think when you look at you know inspiring and, and motivating Gen Z and beyond a lot of that is around experience and so therefore as an employer if you want to be attractive you know for top talent you've got to provide those experiences but I'll go back to you know Dennis has got his survey and we, we've had some of ours back already um, one of the interesting things that came out of it was the younger kids were, were desperate to come back because, you know, in their minds, how, how do they get noticed? How do they learn if they're not in the room in the meetings? You know, if they can't watch their senior leaders at work, you know, a lot of, you know, what you learn is through experience. It's not in a classroom. Um, and so when you think about talent management and bringing those people through, you know, the office plays a really critical part in, bringing people together and creating those learning experiences and you know one of the things that we've done as we've been looking at this future of work as we're calling it it's a big project within Deutsche Bank at the moment is the you know human resources side of things so not just well-being but also talent acquisition and retention and training and development it's the technology what can we use and you know in technology to help people you know when they come in if they're on split operations how do they find who they want to sit next to, um, you know, when they come in, because actually if you're going to come in one or two days a week, you really want to get the most out of it. So, you know, it's what toolkit can we provide them? You know, it's going to be really imperative on landlords and employers to show how often the space is being cleaned and when was the last time a meeting room was cleaned. All of those things we can put onto toolkits, you know, we're using host from CBRE that we've just made that decision. Um, but there are many, tools out there that you know companies can look at and one of those things that we're looking at is using them to communicate on a really broad basis with our staff and make them feel 
at ease to come into the office and be able to do that quickly and easily. Um, and, you know, last but not least, you know, I still come back to mental health and well-being. I think it's really important that the spaces of the future create the right environment for people to feel okay. Um, and, you know, I think people need human beings. I think it's human nature needs change and stimulus. And so I think, again, I come back to, I'm probably very boring, but I don't think it'll be a huge shift from one side to the other. I do, however, completely agree with Dennis. Um, we are going to see a lot more of our staff working from home on a lot more regular basis. And to answer, I think, Thomas, your question around how do we make that sustainable leadership? Leadership is going to play a massive part in permitting working from home when more people are back in the office. And it's really interesting, the conversation that's going on at the moment in Deutsche Bank around permitting that, around permitting for a child to wander through you know, if you're on a, a VC or your dog suddenly barks because somebody's at the door, you know, I think the more that goes on and the more it becomes mainstream and I'm, I'm fingers crossed, neither my children or dogs have made an appearance yet. So that, that's a relief. Um, but, you know, I do think leadership and culture of a company will determine how successful the return to work is. So uh, this is phenomenal. I it, just in the course of a short hour, we have covered so many perspectives, uh, you know, frankly, from both the places you guys are sitting, uh, the, the operations you're covering, and also just in terms of questions. I know that Nisha and I have a bunch more questions, uh, but uh, we only have so much time. Uh, we've checked and we're allowed to carry on the Zoom room a little bit longer, but before doing so, we wanted to check with the panel. Would Are you available to go a little bit over? Because yeah. we, we know some of you are calling in uh, late. So why don't we open the floor to so, some of the questions and please let us know if, if, if you need to bounce off uh, because you're calling and later have another appointment. No hard feelings. We've We've... <laughs> We've covered our hour. Uh, but David, I think you were first and you also asked a very interesting question. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself uh, and, uh, and ask Stella? Sure. Um, I was inquiring around that app that Stella, you were talking about and the code you were uh, portraying. Is that a government provided app or a private industry developed app? And uh, Secondly, how often are you tested to maintain your green um, health condition? Is that once every 24 hours, once every week? Because um, obviously, um, not only this virus, but other health conditions come and go like the wind. So, um, you know, not, you know, if you, if you have an app that is only... Uh, uh, being checked, um, you know, rarely, um, you know, how good is that uh, data? So if you can provide answers to both of those items, I'd be interested. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. I just uh, thinking about the data and I actually, um, I also consider about the privacy, but I also think there's no freedom on the battlefield for field actually um whatever you win or wire when only one can left so at this moment we we're doing the maintenance of our QR code every time we entrance to the building indoor side whatever we want to go to the subway or uh in the um building but if i just stay at home it will be automatically this is just a uh, such like a gps or maybe i think it's just um, um trace my data from the uh, ip address that they just to check whether i'm go to high risk location instead of i'm uh touched or contact with um people who already uh, this this is already um be confirmed because this kind of people already, we already have um, three three level people. Uh, one is some of them already in the hospital. Some of them still on the way. Why? Because it's not affected. 
So nobody can know who will be the next person. So we just uh, use this kind of QR code to show the location, whether I'm in some uh, high risk location instead of what is my condition because QR code not mentioned, um, um, uh, my condition is good or not. It's just to show whether I went to high risk uh, location. And the other one is we use the, um, at this moment, we only can available to use the uh, uh, summer meter to check um, every time when we go to the subway, we, we went and went to the uh, building entrance, but we still need to do the um, such like, like uh, detection of the uh, antibody to check whether I'm the uh, my real condition. So it depends on the situation. This QR code just to show the location, not show my health condition. Thank you, Stella. Thank you very much. I, I see Ed has a really interesting question. Uh, Edward, do you want to unmute and go ahead? Ask the question. Ed? Uh, I, I got a message from Ed that, that he uh, bounced. Uh, so um, the next one up is from Robert McGill. Are, are you still on? Yes, I am, Thomas. Hi. <laughs> So yeah, so what I was wondering is um, for the panelists, um, you know, what the uh, social distancing measures they have taken um, overseas, uh, you know, have done to affect, uh, you know, waiting lines for, for elevators and uh, I guess lobby cafes and, and other, other spaces like that. You know, one of the big concerns in New York City, obviously, is that, you know, we go from packing, you know, uh, you know, six to 12 or sometimes even more people into an elevator to now having to spread them apart where there's maybe only two to six people, you know, and uh, some of the concerns are gonna be, you know, uh, line queues, you know, around the block for elevators, um, you know, and there's a lot of different discussions about how, um, at least in New York City, those things will be addressed. I'm just, just curious if there's any best practices that have been adopted. I mean, maybe, maybe I'll start. So I think in high rise locations, clearly this is a huge issue. Um, and, you know, New York, obviously huge high rise, same thing, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, Shanghai. I think the way we've handled it is we've really worked hard to have um, not so many people in the office. So the first thing is, you know, you manage that by initiating split operations where, you know, particularly roles that are non-regulated or that can work from home easily should continue to work from home. Um, and then those roles that are coming back in really are those that need to be in. Um, then we've, stage two uh, of the plan is to stagger entry times. A lot of that is market dependent um, uh, from a financial services, but it could be anything that you would determine as, you know, for, for a different company. Um, and then the third thing is to have lift attendants and to make sure that those lift attendants are protected with the correct PPE. And that's what we've done and we, we've really tried hard. Initially, I don't think anybody um, could say they didn't have queues um, around the block. Uh, definitely when we first started to come back in to some of the offices, particularly um, in China and Hong Kong, that was definitely the case. But I honestly think people get into a rhythm um, and people generally are just very sensible and want to be part of the solution. Um, uh, human nature is much more that way. So I think, you know, once people get into it and they understand the protocols, generally they work really hard at that. Another thing we asked was for people within teams just to work out how could they stagger um, meal times, you know, times where they go out for coffee, that kind of stuff. Um, and again, people have just worked really hard with us on that and have just taken personal accountability to work on helping not, uh, you know, overrun you know, limited cafe and uh, restaurant facilities. So I think, you know, a lot of people brought in their food and, you know, that helps as well because you've just got not got that many people then going out. So we did say to people, if you can, you should. So I think, you know, the only thing we did have to provide was more microwaves and things. If people wanted to heat their food up, that was something that um, we definitely got wrong in the early days. We didn't think of that one, darn it. Um, but we, we got there in the end. So I think, you know, these are, I, I go back to, I just think people are going to be really practical and really patient and then you get into a rhythm but it does it does take a couple of weeks i don't know what you thought you know dennis yeah no, i mean i think generally um asians are much more tolerant of queues i mean people in our buildings used to queue pre-covid right and these asians seem to be 
attuned to queuing, whereas us from, from the Western world, we certainly, uh, I, I can't stand the queue. I'd rather go for a coffee while we queue. So, so I think there's a different tolerance level. I think people are much more accepting. And um, Catherine's point, you know, we are, we are staggering people coming back. We're asking people to be sensible. And you know, I, I think people have generally been really good about this. I, I'm not sure how maybe they've worked in, in, a, in our offices in the US and the UK, um, but I certainly feel Asia is much more tolerant of queues. And that, I think they understand that this is going to, it, it will change over time. This is a, a period of, of, you know, uncertainty, a period of unrest. And I think they accept it. But I think, that, you know, as I said at the very start to me, the key for us is, is try and keep as many people at home. Just take, take the burden and the pressure off the building. If you don't need to be in the office, why come in? Especially if you have to commute to come in uh, over distance. Yeah, I, just to add, I completely agree with that, Dennis. And we started to bring people back in Germany and France and some of the countries across the rest of Europe. And again, very non-patient for things like lift queuing times. But the positive that I would say is, again, people have just really taken personal accountability and they're just trying to be kind, I think. And that's the overarching thing that we've asked people. Can you just be, take a deep breath and be kind? Because, you know, this is really tough for everybody. And the last thing we need is people sort of having dramas every three minutes. And generally people have really responded very well to that. And I think it's about communication and planning. You know, those two things you just can't, Dennis sounded like he'd got a plan, Northern Trust absolutely have got a plan. And I think that's the key thing that you just realize what you've got, work out how your people get to work, try and stagger that, work out, as Dennis said, try and keep as many people from being at home as you can. And then if you need to rotate them in one or two days a week, and that will really help you. Yeah. Well, one of the things just maybe to, to add to that, and I think there's, um, there's, there's been something phenomenal happening in the bank for us is we found that um, a number of our traders and our, uh, our, our senior staff have all been contributing together to, to give our first line, the cleaners, the security guards, some money. You know, they, they, and we've got to go through all the normal protocols of handing out money, but the, the people have been very empathetic to the work that these people have to do. And the people are, are raising money in the office to support those people who know uh, are less paid, maybe doing longer hours, longer commute. Just to see the empathy that people have got has been phenomenal. And I, wow. you know, that's not, it's not something I anticipated, but it's something that's real. And it's beautiful to see, I have to say. Wow. Uh, Mariella, are you still on? Uh, you had a question about temperature checks. Marielle Hart? Uh, okay. Well, so anyway, I guess it, since that I already raised it. So Marielle asks, uh, are you doing temperature checks at the office? Uh, yeah. And then she asked, if so, are you maintaining social distancing while people are lining up? To yes. do those checks. Um, yes. So I guess you've been responding to the the check with your mind <laughs> anyway. But are you are you so how how frequently and how are you conducting these? Well, I, I'm happy to go very quickly. We, we, anybody that walks into one of our buildings, whether it's a landlord building or whether it's an SCB building, their temperature checked every time they come in, even if they go out for lunch, they're checked. Um, and, and and certainly in Singapore, you can't enter any space now, any retail space without being checked. You know. To Stella's point, we have a, we have a social distancing uh, tool. We have a, a QR app that people are, we know where people, it's a tra contract tracing app. So people are getting accustomed to this. You can't walk into a shop now without having to, to fill in a QR code or fill in a piece of paperwork, but it's every time you enter. And in most of the retail outlets, certainly in Singapore, every time you leave. So it's both the entry and the exit. You have to, you have to get uh, confirmed, but you temperature checked every entry point. Yeah, and I just think it depends on the volume of footfall. You know, in some build, some of our really large buildings, they're the big sort of fully made arches that you just walk through. So it just checks it as you go through. And it's really binary. You know, if your temperature is up, it really doesn't matter what the reason is, you're not coming in. And I think that's also a really important thing for these things to, be, to work. You've just got to be really clear from the outset that it's a binary thing. If your temperature reading is up, you just have to go home and then you can try the next day. Um, and then in the less you know, the less footfall uh, type buildings, it's handheld. Um, you know, the accuracy varies clearly, um, but obviously in our really dense buildings, that's, that's pretty important. So Thomas, question. you know, from an India perspective, it becomes law, you know, it's, it's a mandate that anybody coming to the office or a building need 
to undergo a thermal a temperature check. So you got the landlord doing it or the companies doing it, and uh, yeah, it's become it's it, it, it's become an essential part. Right, every time you walk into the building, it's now become a mandate. You need to undergo a temperature check. And in some of the other APAC, in Singapore, they have now mandated companies to keep records of people being done. So, so I think it's, I think from a company perspective, uh, since the numbers are low coming in initially, you know, uh, it would be easier, but we are looking at installing, you know, a, a better uh, temperature one where you can walk past and and your temperature gets uh, recorded. But I think companies would do what they need to do on day one, but people are evaluating a better equipment so that it can be done better and quicker. I think one last question before we round it up, because uh, on Wednesday morning, people, I see 42 people still on. That is fantastic. And our panelists have a late night going on. Uh, one of the curious one I see in the chat is about co-working space. Uh, so how much of your portfolio is co-working and uh, how much nervous you are about that? Who is governing the hygiene and uh, you know safety when it comes to co-working portfolio? So any of you take a lead I'm, on that. I'm happy to go. I mean, we, we um we have been nervous about co-working. We've had um, a number of our staff, pro project-based staff in co-working centres. We have pulled them out of the majority of those centres. There's a couple of specific projects that we can't pull them out of. It is something that we're concerned about. Um, because we ultimately believe that we'll be dropping space, uh, we believe now that we have the ability to absorb those people into our uh, existing space or so they can work from home. So we would rather, again, we would rather they work from home than, than be in a co-working space because we can't control that necessarily. Uh, so again, we're just encouraging people to work from home. And we found that it was very easy for us to empty our co-working centers because the majority of people work from home, have worked from home. At, at the peak, we were 96% of our population were working from home. Um, and I don't think that we would ever go back into a co-working space unless we could control the demise. Yeah, I think that's... Countering... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I think that's going to be the challenge, right? And I think, but but look, I think the, the good news is there are really good systems out there for co-working companies to take advantage of now to communicate proactively with the customers. You know, what's going to become key, you know, we think about provenance in terms of, you know, artwork or food chain or, or whatever. And I think now provenance will be you know, how clean is that? How many people have been sick in that building if it's a co-working space? You know, how do I know when I go into that space that, you know, how often was it cleaned? Who's been in there before? That kind of stuff. And I think, I think for co-working companies, that's going to be the challenge is to really, really promote health and well-being in, in, the, in the space itself from a really binary perspective to ensure that people feel safe to come back in. We have a very small proportion of our space you know i think banks are probably the worst for this simply because you know we've got so many compliance restrictions and so it's very hard for us to just say yeah go work in an open space in a co-working environment we just can't really do that generally um but i think we we have like dennis had project groups we had our lab for example for a period of time in the rework uh, building in the fulton center in new york that's now pulled back inside our envelope because we can fit it um so i think I think the challenge will be for co-working. I think co-working is still a brilliant concept if you are a small budding business that doesn't want to eat up its capital through you know, real estate charges and, and also wants to have that conscious collision and collaboration opportunity with other startups and other companies. So I think the proposition is still a really exciting one. I think now it's time for the co-working companies to probably grow up a little bit in some respects and they've now really got to show that provenance of the space and the fact that anybody consuming it, you know, is ultimately as safe there as they would be anywhere else. And I think, I think there are so many fabulous systems and apps to help people with that, that I, you know, I think it's something they'll overcome for sure. But, you know, I, I think people will be nervous for a period of time if it's not under their direct control, you know, how, how can you ask an employee to go into that space? I don't think you can. Yeah, and I just maybe to add to add, I do think that the whole commercial model of a co-working space at the moment is under question because you know, yes. if I look at my environments, we've got 1.8 meter centres between desks. At best, you've got a meter uh, in those centres. So the assumption is that they have to reduce uh, 
their occupancy by at least 50%. So I question whether that model has to be reset. So guys, Nishar said it, uh, you guys have been absolutely phenomenal. Sanjeev, Stella, Catherine, and Dennis, uh, and, and also the, the audience, some brilliant questions. We're, uh, you know, still 35 people here on, on a Wednesday morning in New York, which is uh, the, the busiest time of day. So, you know, just thank you so much. I think one takeaway is that despite the, uh, the great differences, there's still a lot of commonality and there seems to be a lot of takeaways from both internally in your portfolios and also your co collaboration. I can sense it with other companies and, and whether there are government, uh, government policies or not, it seems like the companies are, are really taking initiative to move forward your own governance policies. Um, before we wrap it up, Nishar, do you wanna add anything? I'm just extremely thankful. I know panelists uh, are staying up so late for, you know, sharing their insights and knowledge. So I think uh, before anything, we should just close it off uh, on a very good note and wish you all good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you all are. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. I'll see Thanks. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.